Hello and welcome back to Building Integrity. I'm your host Josh Porter and I hope everybody had a great uh, Christmas break and New Year. Um, we're getting back into on this video talking about Champlain Tower South and the lawsuit. We're continuing that conversation in this video. We're talking about the association, essentially uh, the surviving members of Champlain Tower South suing the association, the organization. But I wanted to talk about some other CTS news before I get into that. Um, there has been another relatively important lawsuit um, filed uh, recently uh, against the developers of 87 Park, the neighbors. So this is another uh, uh, legal firm that feels that this is um, uh, an entity that needs to be pursued. Um, and this lawsuit was filed on behalf of the receiver uh, of, of Champlain Towers South. Uh, also recently, the Miami Herald came out with a really good article um, about the collapse and the initiating kind of uh, sequences that they think happened. And uh, there are two really important things I think that are in this article, and I'm going to be covering this in my next video, um, but just to touch on them here, one of them is the uh, timeline of the eyewitness accounts, which I think is really probably the most important thing in the article, uh, even though most of the article time was spent on um, on the uh, physics of it and, and, the, uh, and the computer software modeling that was done. Now, that software modeling, that's the second part I wanted to talk about, was done by uh, Professor Don Lehman of the University of Washington. And um, now, now that we have the eyewitness accounts and we have this computer modeling in the Miami Herald uh, uh, article, I think now we can start presenting something that, uh, that has been on my mind for a long time, uh, which is why did the um, tower collapse when it did? Why, what, what, what significance does the time of day have to do with that? And where do we now think the initiating uh, sequence of events, where did everything start? So we'll be covering that in the next video. Now, in order to understand why the association would sue itself or how it can sue itself, one of the things you need to understand is when you are a condo owner, you essentially don't actually personally own any individual part of the building. Let's say you live on the seventh floor, okay, unit five. So you're in unit 705. Well, you don't own the floor that you're standing on. You don't own the ceiling that's over your head. You don't own the walls, the tenant separation walls that are between you and your neighbor's unit. What you own is everything inside of that. So you technically legally own airspace, okay? And you own airspace 70 feet above the ground, X wide by X wide, right? And so what happens is, is anything you build within that airspace, the toilets, the countertops, the non-bearing walls, all of those things you own, but, uh, but, the, but those aren't part of the structure of the building. So you don't really own any piece of the structure of the building. The structure of the building, the slabs, the walls, the beams, the columns, they are owned by the association of which you are a member. So if you want to, let's say, have a concrete wall right next to your unit repaired, you can't just go and do that yourself. Even though you can physically see it and it's, and it's in your eyesight, you have to go through the association and convince them to go ahead and fix it. And so what the problem is, is then if your association board consists of five to seven people, let's say, and they don't want to fix your damage on your wall, you have an uphill battle because these five or seven people make a decision for the 200 something people that live in the building, right? So, uh, so, so, but this association board, okay, the, and all associations in Florida, throughout the rest of the United States, and really throughout the world, there are laws that regulate condo associations. Um, and in this case, the, the association in Florida, the way we say it is, is that they have a duty to maintain, a fiduciary duty to maintain the structure and the property in a safe and work, working condition. Um, those rules and regulations can be found inside the condos, uh, the condominiums controlling documents themselves. They can also be found in local municipal codes, in this case, the Miami-Dade uh, Code of Ordinances, and you can also find it in state or, or, or federal statutes and laws. In this case, we have Florida statutes that govern uh, this. And all of them say the same thing, that the association, that board is responsible for maintaining the structure. So this sort of kinds of begins makes helps you to understand well why would the residents the group of residents the surviving residents of Champlain Tower South why would they sue the association wouldn't you know aren't they essentially kind of suing themselves kind of sorta of. that board and that the organization called the association not the individual people but the organization carries insurance and so in order to collect on the insurance 
and, and there's insurance. They insure the individual board members and they insure the association itself. In order to collect on that insurance, okay, the residents really, in, in this case, need to sue themselves. They have to sue the condo association of which they belong to in order to essentially sue those insurance companies. So it's a way to get to those insurance companies and to get to those proceeds from those insurance companies. So now getting back into the lawsuit filed by the surviving members against the um, uh, against the multiple parties, right? But getting back into this lawsuit that we've been going through in this video series, we want to look at what the claims are that the attorney is making uh, or what the what the client is making uh, in this lawsuit. So here it says uh, the association knew or should have known that certain parts of the building had been damaged and were failing, resulting in damage to the structure itself and the interiors of the units. Okay, so they're kind of claiming that like, you know, they, they didn't fulfill, what they're getting at is that fiduciary responsibility. They didn't fulfill that fiduciary responsibility because they they knew or they should have known based on the information that they have. Now, this is a case that they're gonna have to build based on this sentence. In the years preceding the collapse, evidence of concrete damage, cracking, and spalling throughout the building were apparent and brought to the association's attention several times by the residents. And so again, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna bring up evidence to support this. Uh, by the maintenance manager and in a building inspection conducted in 2018. And again, that goes back to that engineer's report, that Morabito report in 2018. The association repeatedly neglected these warnings. Now, I underline the word warnings because this is going to be a key point. What's going to happen is, yes, they're going to show that you had a report from 2018. Yes, they're going to show that you had emails from residents, uh, uh, but were they engineers, right? Are they qualified to actually warn um, and, and, and so does this rise to the level of a warning that was ignored? Because that's going to be very important. That's going to be an argument in order to win against the, the association that the surviving re residents are going to have to make and win is that they were warned that the building was unsafe and they ignored that warning. Okay, so then they go on to say that any one of the findings in the 2018 report, so again, this is the engineer Morbido's report, constituted a dangerous condition that rendered CTS an unsafe structure. Taken together, the collective structural problems Morbido identified posed an enormous risk to health, life, and safety of the building's owners, residents, occupants, and guests. Now, the problem with this statement is this is sort of like an after the fact statement. Now that we know that the building collapsed, we know all these things were dangerous, scary warning signs. But at the time they relied very heavily on expert uh, expert uh, opinion. And so in the 2018 report, you know, and, and going back to the sentence, it says that it constituted a dangerous condition and rendered CTS an unsafe structure. Both of those are phrases, dangerous and unsafe structure, are, that aren't found in the 2018 report, Morabito report. And you got to imagine, I've done enough of these reports that when you do this report and you present it to the board, you're going to be asked your opinion. Well, do you think we should evacuate the building or do you, you know, what is this really scary? Now, in this case, we don't know if they asked Morabito this or had this type of meeting, but we do know that they had the city engineer come in, okay, for the, from the town of Surfside. And that engineer or told them, the, 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 the town's engineer told them that the, their building was safe. So you can see how this sort of diffuses the concern found in the 2018 Morbido report when you have another expert telling you that the building is safe. Um, and so, but again, we still do have the report in context with everything else. You, you can't just isolate and say, well, they can rely just on this report. They have to sort of rely on all the information, all the data, all the history of the building combined things and information that maybe Morabito wasn't even aware of himself, right? When he did when he did his study. So they go on to say that moreover, the association failed to warn anyone about the risks these significant structural problems posed to the building's unit owners, residents, occupants, and guests. So when they're saying, you know, failed to warn, now what they're saying is, is this they're making an argument that they failed to communicate to the residents that the building was unsafe. Well, if the but, but again, this they, they have to make and prove the argument that the board knew the building was unsafe because if the board was just ignorant and didn't feel or or didn't uh, didn't believe that the building was unsafe, they wouldn't really have a duty to communicate an unsafe building to people if they actually didn't believe it was unsafe. So I think this is sort of a this part of the lawsuit is a, is a bit weaker because um, you'll find that uh, a lot of residents had copies of the Morbido report and had a lot of this historical data and information. So trying to make this um, 
trying to make this argument that the association failed to communicate or warn us is uh, is is much weaker than the previous arguments that they're trying to make, which is that they should have known, right? And that was part of that phrase before. So uh, they go on to say, and now this is an interesting um, key here, because what this is 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 in the lawsuit, the attorney has quoted emails and, and included excerpts from emails. So I'm sorry how, how bad the resolution is on this. You'll just have to, uh, I'll, I'll read it to you. But in, in, the, um, in the lawsuit, he uses a lot of emails and a lot of letters that were written to the board, letters that were written to 87 park developers and letters that were written to the town of Surfside by concerned residents. And if you'll, you'll pay attention, you'll find out that a lot of these letters are all written by the same handful of residents, okay? Um, in, in this case, in 2018, okay, they get the Morabito report, they talk to the town of Surfside, the Surfside engineer tells them, hey, your building's safe, and the board wants to do a massive renovation project to make their uh, entryway lobby and their hallways nicer looking. And this is after receiving the Morabito report. And so the, the, uh, one of the residents writes a letter, and I'm gonna quote some sections out of this letter, um, where she writes this letter to the association's attorney, um, trying to convince him like, hey, you know, they're trying, we have a building that is structurally unsafe and they're trying to renovate the lobby. So here, here I'll start uh, at the beginning. It says, in the meantime, the board levied a special assessment two years ago with a two-year interest fee, uh, interest-free payment plan, which included half a million dollars to be designated for a hallway renovation. So they're saying that uh, she's writing this in 2018. She's saying in 2016 they levied a special assessment, uh, which means that they they told the residents you have to give us money so that we can do this half a million dollar hallway renovation project. Now, in 2018, the board wants to pass an additional special assessment for the hallway renovation because the price of completing this project has increased over the past two years due to inflation. So now the board is trying to give a second special assessment, again, not to fix the building, not to fix the columns and the beams and the structure of the building, but to renovate the hallway in 2018. And so her, the person writing this letter, and several other residents were obviously very upset that they would be spending money renovating a lobby and hallway area um, when the building, in their opinion, was in, 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 in a deleterious condition. Now, she goes on to say, the board plans on adopting a budget and a special assessment on November 15th, uh, that, that date was corrected up here. Uh, the board has tried to adopt the special assessment on the 23rd of October. So we're talking the 23rd of October, 2018. Okay, they tried to adopt the special assessment on the 23rd of October and they were not successful. This special assessment cannot pass since it needs owner's approval and the owners are more concerned about the structural damage at this time. So what happens is you can see that there is actually a power struggle now beginning. The board, um, sort of like think of your own country, right? Your own prime minister or your own president wants to get something done, but the rest of the, uh, uh, the leaders in government don't want to get done. You're sort of neutered. You have no ability to get anything done if you can't create consensus. Well, in this case, the board members wanted to renovate the hallway and ignore the structure of the building or at least push it down the road where there was a group of residents that wanted to prioritize the, the structural repair of the building in 2018. Well, like most power struggles, these things don't get resolved in a day. So over the course of three years, from 2018 to 2021, some of these residents, in fact, residents who wrote the very letters that are in this lawsuit, eventually start taking seats on the board. Okay, so they start convincing their neighbors, hey, we need to get this board member off of here. You need to vote me in so that we can get this building fixed. Well, it takes them three years. So a lot of people who comment in the comment section and stuff like that and they say well you know this is the this is the the the, uh, the the board's fault for ignoring this and putting their head in the sand i don't think you can blame the entire association for that attitude so clearly there was a power struggle where half of the residents or a good chunk of the residents or maybe the majority of the residents wanted the building to be restored they wanted it to be restored in 2018 okay but they didn't have the power to make that happen. They didn't have board seats and the board didn't want to entertain having this done, at least not right away. 
So anyway, but from 2018 to 2021, these concerned residents, the very same very ones that write these letters uh, that, are, that are quoted in this lawsuit, uh, eventually start taking seats on the board. And then finally, in 2021, okay, the new board, which is a composite of these new members and some of the old members, but this, uh, this new board um, finally levies an assessment in 2021 to do the structural repairs, okay? And so one of the claims in the lawsuit, getting to this and quoting this, this meeting in 2021, and so it's a two-part statement here, but the first part is the claim, which is the association also failed to inform CTS's unit owners, residents, occupants, or guests that the building suffered from structural damage in need of repair until the association issued uh, its April 2021 form letter addressing those repairs and admitting its failures. And they quote, and, and the, the attorney's quoting this um, 20, April 2021 form letter. Now, remember, this is months before the partial collapse of Champlain Tower South. And they say, a lot of this work could have been done or planned in years gone by, but this is where we are now. And so what it is, is it's the current board essentially making an indictment against the prior board saying, you know, we should have done this in 2018 or 2017 or whatever, right? But this is where we are now. Now that, that statement, this is where we are now, isn't a, a laissez-faire sort of like, like, oh, well, we took three years to do this. It's the new board saying we finally got into position and we're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to levy this assessment. We're going to get this building structurally repaired. Um, and, 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 and they're basically blaming, passively blaming the prior board for sticking their head in the sand. Um, but as you all know, April, 2021 was essentially too late by the time you start putting together funds. And by the time you start thinking about, um, uh, how, how you're going to get this done, April, 2021, you're not going to start work in, in, uh, 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 May or June. I mean, by the time you levy a special assessment in April, you're really planning on maybe starting construction in the winter of 2021. So just given the way delays are permitting and everything else. So, um, so given that the fact that the building collapsed in, uh, um, uh, in the summer of when it did in 2021, uh, partially collapsed, I should say, this sort of just shows you that that they were the, the new board was making strides. They wanted to get this building fixed, but it was just all too late. They just got to it too late. They got into power too late, and they couldn't uh, um, they couldn't get the building fixed fast enough. In other words, um, I think one of the things that that this portion of the lawsuit starts bringing to the surface, which I'll be covering uh, in the next lawsuit video, is this claim that that the engineer uh, told them that the building was unsafe and the association board ignored it. What's a little difficult for them is then later on, which we'll cover in that next lawsuit uh, series video, uh, which is their lawsuit against Morabito, against the engineer, um, they're, they're kind of claiming that Morabito failed to warn them. So is it that Morbido warned them and they ignored it, or is it that they failed to warn them? And that's something we'll, we'll look at in more depth um, in the next video in this series. Well, I hope you guys learned something and enjoyed this. I look forward to next time. Thanks.